you're not going to regret being here for this tooth pickings today. Hi, I'm Brian. I can't, I won't, and I don't stop tooth picking. And today, my guest is Dr. Nick Bellantoni, the emeritus archaeologist for the state of Connecticut. And what a career Dr. Nick has had. Uh, he has been involved in going into so many tombs, into rescuing so many remains, into repatriating bodies to their native soil, and even, and I'm not sure how much detail I want to go into here because I don't want you to abandon this video, uh, but he was one of the people who looked at the skull that the Soviet Union had held on to for many years to decide whether or not it was actually Hitler's skull, and I don't want to give too much away, but might not have been. Dr. Bellantoni is going to tell us about one of the more fascinating episodes in the very long American vampire panic. That is the, uh, the scare, the endemic that lasted from the 1700s to the late 1800s in the, uh, New England, United States, where people were digging up and desecrating bodies to prevent vampires from coming back and killing their families. I'm going to let Dr. Bellantoni tell the story. You're going to find it really interesting. Stick around. Dr. Nick Bellantoni, thank you so much for being here on the Toothpickings webcast. Well, we appreciate you having us. You came into, into the whole uh, piece of the American vampire narrative kind of differently. You, you, you weren't a folklorist before, and you, you weren't someone who studied vampires. How did you kind of accidentally become one of the big players in this tale? Well, it was exactly accidentally. Um, as the Connecticut State Archaeologist, uh, I had responsibilities for um, responding to police investigations and, um, and construction activities whenever human skeletal remains were uncovered during ground moving activities. Uh, and as a result, in this particular case, back way back in 1990, um, I got notified by the state police and the chief state's medical examiner's office because uh, two human skulls had been found in a gravel pit. And um, I got called in, uh, the skulls were old. We recognized that right away from the cortical loss of, the, of some of the bone and the cranial wall area. Um, and um, realized that they had encountered a, an old graveyard um, colonial era. Uh, and of course, it was my job to go out, investigate. And in this case, uh, because of the nature of the gravel bank, and we had to remove those individuals to another cemetery. Uh, and in the process of that, we found one burial that was completely rearranged and uh, in the grave. And that led us down the road to um, the concept of the New England vampire folk belief. Uh, we contacted our colleague, uh, Michael Bell, uh, who is a folklorist, and uh, together we've been on this journey for a long time. Now you recognized pretty quickly that this was a very old graveyard, very old forgotten graveyard, colonial era. What did you see in that one grave that was different that made your ears perk up and say, this is more than just a really old grave. What's going on here? Well, but basically the reason we realized what we had was uh, um, when I got to the gravel bank and I looked up on the high cliff, um, the topsoil had obviously been removed and they were mining the subsoil for construction purposes. But you could see coming down the top six dark stains uh, in a row and we recognize those stains as burial grave shafts. So you dig a hole, you put the coffin down, you re put the soil back in and refill it. Uh, you change um, the soil content, you change the, the, the coloration, the, um, so it becomes mixed and modeled in those areas rather than nicely horizontally stratified. So when you see six of those, you realize that, I realized that they had hit a, the, probably the first row of an, old colonial graveyard. And in that area, which is Griswold, Connecticut, along the Quinnebock River, um, we have many um, grave sites in those areas where farmers were burying in the dead, uh, in the backyard, kind of in the lower 40. So um, 
you know, with all of that, we realized what we had. And of course, the gravel bank had already had um, all their permits. They were underway. It was, it was an active construction mining scene. So we had to remove um, in order to preserve. Um, so in doing that, uh, we had excavated, um, just we started with those burials along the cliff because those were the most fragile. Uh, they were, in fact, what led to the skulls uh, being discovered. Um, and um, so we wanted to handle those burials first. And uh, the first ones we started to come down on on the edge were, um, you know, were nice anatomical position. The skeletal remains were pretty well preserved. Uh, nice anatomical positions laying on their back in a supine position. Um, the east-west orientation, head to the west, classic Christian burial practice. Yeah, because, because they would wanted to have the head west so that they could see the sun rising in the east. Is that the way it was? That's right. So that they could be prepared for the day of resurrection when Christ would come up with the sun out of the east and literally draw them from their housing. Um, so everything was appropriate uh, for a farming family cemetery. But we got to one burial, which was in a stone crypt, okay? They had taken good old Eastern Connecticut flat field stones and they had arched them to create um, a crypt over the, uh, the coffin uh, that was laid down. Um, and so um, in coming down on that, uh, we could see that some of the stones had been broken um, along the, the top of the arch. And, um, but that was not unusual because of earth pressures and so forth. And when I lifted the, the stone to reveal the, the, the coffin and skeletal remains underneath um, of this particular burial, the feet uh, and, 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 and the shin bones or the tibia were in perfect anatomical position. But as I started to move up the burial and uncover it, removing the stone, um, um, I could see that the femurs or the thigh bones, if you will, uh, were uprooted from their anatomical position and crossed over their ch the chest area. The chest area had been broken into, that is to say the, 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 the fractures uh, that we noticed in the ribs were not, you know, uh, immediately after death or early. These were, had happened a, a, probably about five years after the individual had died. Uh, and the, the, the cranium or the skull was deliberately decapitated and rotated around so that the face was facing the west and not the east. And of course, you know, I was befuddled because I had never seen a burial like this, uh, all rearranged. Um, uh, uh, and I had no idea what was going on. My first thoughts were possibly vandalism. And while you can never use negative evidence in archaeology, if you don't find it, you can't invent that it was there. Um, but you're, you're 50 miles away from uh, where Mercy Brown had been dug up at this point in Exeter, but that connection was opaque to you. That, that wasn't anything that was on your radar? No, not at all. I wasn't even, I, I wasn't, at this point, uh, I wasn't even aware of the vampire folk belief or any of this. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I looked at this and I'd never seen anything like this before. And I certainly, uh, my thoughts were vandalism, but, but that didn't work because none of the other graves had anything in them um, that would be worth, uh, worth stealing. And, um, and it was at that point, actually, as I was um, communicating with some of my colleagues and, and what I found um, that one of them said, have you heard the story of the Jewish city vampire? And at that point I hadn't. And when I was told that story, um, I then uh, made contact with Michael Bell in Rhode Island because he had been long before I found uh, uh, this particular burial. He was already investigating the, the New England vampire folk belief. And that's when we, he and I started to um, correspond. And more and more, we saw that this might be a, a vampire activity and set up the hypothesis um, to, to test what we found, not only in the ground, but forensically with the remains themselves. We've had Michael Bell here on this uh, webcast yep. before, and, and possibly will again. You probably know this. He's got this uh, a new book he's uh, almost finished re writing. So hopefully uh, he'll come back and tell us a bit about that.
Yeah, um, his book is a classic, and uh, yes. he's, um, he's always coming up with new and new research uh, uh, that makes it so exciting. Set the scene for me at the period of time where these burials would have taken place. Um, what kind of uh, epidemic or pandemic uh, were people dealing with at that time? Well, the, we were able to fortunately find enough wood of the coffin to to date it. Uh, and the dates, uh, you know, are early 19th century based on the coffin. So, um, you know, anywhere between, you know, I was estimating anywhere between, you know, 18... 100 to 1830, 1840. Uh, and um, that was a, a time in New England when, um, you know, before germ theory, before antibiotics, that diseases like tuberculosis or what they called consumption back then were really quite epidemic. Um, you know, that pulmonary disease of coughing and uh, spreading the, uh, the, the bacteria. Um, that whole transmission was unknown. And you had farming families, large families, you know, as they typically were back then, um, you know, living in uh, houses that were relatively unsanitary by our standards. But people were, were grouped together within those houses so that, you know, a, a tubercular victim who, could be sitting at the table with, you know, eight or nine other family members and, and coughing and coughing. And that same tubercular victim could be sleeping uh, in a bedroom with four or five other brothers and sisters and coughing and coughing. And you know, literally the disease is spreading uh, re uh, really among families. And, um, um, and of course, they, they had no means of stopping it. They, they didn't understand it. You know, the local doctors could not help them. Um, before antibiotics or, or anything like that. And the churches couldn't help them. Um, and just to be clear, this is pre-germ theory. No one is even suspecting that there's microbial things spreading. That, exactly right. Pre-germ uh, uh, theory. So they had no idea, you know, uh, about transmission and so forth. And so there were a lot of speculation, a lot of ideas um, I, I know one of the issues was that there were some doctors in the area um, that were from Europe and uh, kind of believed that it was the dead who had died of those diseases that um, were capable of leaving the housing of their graves and feeding on and transmitting their disease to living family members. And, uh, so that it was the dead that were mischievous, the dead that were coming back and feeding. And so in order to, you know, uh, put the, to make the dead really dead, um, to stop the, uh, the transmission, you had to go into the graves to find out which one of your ancestors was kind of mischievous, was undead. Uh, and um, and then do whatever was necessary to um, you know, put them to rest. Uh, usually uh, in New England, it was by burning, uh, burning the heart, uh, um, but also um, you know uh, some rearrangement. So one of the things uh, you know in the field, going back to the the burial. And by the way, the the burial we uncovered was an, an adult male, um, comes to be fifty five or so years old. He uh, was a good farmer and on the lid of his coffin, they had hammered the initials JB. So we knew we had uh, somebody of a B surname uh, that was involved here, uh, but we failed to really at that time find any good evidence of which B family. And uh, one of our problems is we, we, we never could find death records that matched up to uh, JB. Um, laying next to him was an adult woman, IB. And then by her was a 13 year old adolescent with, adolescent with the initials uh, NB. So we, we, we knew we had uh, like a small family here, a nuclear family, or at least that's what our belief was, but we could never find them in the, in the, in the records. Uh, the problem was with the B surname is that uh, 
we had so many candidates in the historical record of Griswold. We had bishops, Bennets, Burtons, Browns, Bissells, Barbers, um, and exactly you know which one we were dealing with without specific the death records. We were at a loss, and it remained a loss for for quite a long time as to this family. Um, no, I, I lost my train of thought. I got sidetracked with JB. We, I, I do well, want to come back to that, but we were talking about consumption. Um, and I understand Michael Bell took you to a, a forgotten graveyard and showed you a grave from 1840, 1841, and it had something inscribed on there. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, well, you know, my, Michael and I, once we started to collaborate, um, went to a number of places. Uh, and one was in... Um, North Smithfield, um, Massachusetts, uh, excuse me, Rhode Island. Um, and he took me to the grave um, of a young man, a guy by the name of Whipple, who, who died in his 20s. And uh, underneath the, the tombstone with all of the good you know, data was um, an epitaph and it read, although the vampire's grasp has seized thy mortal frame, thy ardent and inspiring mind untouched remained the same. And that was the first time I had ever seen the concept of vampirism and consumption um, in the same kind of sentence in the same verse. Uh, so making the con connection between a vampire who, who was preying on the living and spreading uh, the disease. And by the way, when, when our colleagues down in Washington at uh, Walter Reed, um, Reed's uh, uh, Armed Forces Institute of, of, of Pathology um, did the initial forensic work, they found clear signs, um, lesions on uh, JB's ribs that were of consumption or tuberculosis. So um, that connection was very powerful in, in testing the hypothesis. So, so everything points towards JB and maybe even other members of his family having consumption, JB being exhumed, his uh, body desecrated in some sort of ritual that would have prevented him from rising up and uh, infecting, attacking others. That's exactly right. I know there's an in the family. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, when the, these, that's the working hypothesis that that's why he was so totally rearranged. Michael never found a lot of evidence for rearrangement in New England, but we think what might have happened here is most of the other cases that uh, Michael Bell has come up with uh, historic accounts usually people went back into the graves very shortly after the suspected vampire died, uh, or at least uh, within months. We, we believe based on the fracture of the bones we saw with JB that they did not return until maybe five years after he died, which probably meant that if they were going in there searching for like they did with Mercy Brown and others, um, and, 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 and certainly with Henry Ray um, in Jewett City, they were looking for blood in the heart. And the blood was kind of a sign that uh, the person was still alive and, and consuming blood. So uh, the issue becomes, um, would there be blood there by five years? Um, it's gone. Most of the soft tissue, if anything, were gone. They might have been only, when they opened up JB's grave, they may have been confronted with only uh, bones or very desiccated uh, soft tissue. Uh, and so they probably had to make a decision. Was this guy a vampire or not? Or was he in fact preying on his family? Uh, and I think what they probably did is they, you know, to err on the side of conservatism, that is to say, Let's not take any chances. So at that point, they decapitated him. They uprooted his legs um, because I'm sure they were not sure how he was able to get out of the grave. Um, and uh, we saw the signs of the broken ribs, which means they were searching for the heart. Yeah, I was going to ask if that meant that they were trying to remove organs or not. 
Yeah, they were. I mean, the, the way I interpret the broken ribs is somebody went in there uh, or went, went into the chest cavity or what was left of it, um, and and then put the uprooted the legs and put that on top of the chest. So um, you know, there may not have been a heart to burn or anything that they were looking for that was specifically saying that uh, JB was undead, but I think. You know, once they went that far, they were not going to take any chances. So what they did is they, you know, crossed the bones over his chest, decapitated him, and then closed him back up and, you know, closed, refilled the, the grave shaft and walked away until we were later to find it uh, in 1990. And I don't guess there's any kind of uh, record that would tell us whether that was successful and stopping a, a spread of consumption. We just don't, we don't know enough about that family. That's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. However, we do now have some uh, re very recent insights into this. Uh, and that is that, uh, you know, when we, um, when we first did the project, one of the things we did is we submitted, submitted some of the bone for uh, DNA, see if we can get, uh, uh, and while we were pretty successful in getting DNA, our, our what our thoughts were back then was if we can get DNA now and then us as, as, as a family, uh, we were able to find a family and then find descendants, then we could see if we could match those up by taking modern DNA from the, from the, the family members um, and seeing if we can get a match. Uh, but that never developed. We still could not find anything in the, in the, in the historic record town, you know, land deeds, uh, church records, everything we went through, town histories, newspaper accounts. I mean, we found nothing to connect us. Um, but then our colleagues uh, at, uh, back at Walter Reed Hospital um, with the um, medical examiner's office there um, talked to us about doing a new set of DNA. And this was only a few years ago. And taking that and now comparing it with the this databases we have of family trees. Because of the popularity of DNA, a lot of people have been submitting their, their own uh, DNA to, uh, you know, uh, ancestry and uh, family tree DNA and so forth. So a database is developing. Um, uh, so we redid the DNA and we compared it to, I think it was family tree DNA and, um, they found a match with a barber family from uh, actually Norwich and the Griswold area of Connecticut. Uh, and then subsequent research, specific, you know, zoning in on barbers, we did find a, a, an account of a, a John Barber who died in the eight, 1820s. And what made that interesting was that he had a son, Nathan Barber, who died at 12 years of age. And one of the graves we found next to, uh, two over from JB, had the initials NB13, um, initials NB, um, 13 years of age. So it could be that we are now looking at John Barber and his son, Nathan. Um, but we have not been able to find any other uh, records. So we, his wife, for example, uh, or, or any, any further records. But it's kind of intriguing now. Uh, because of DNA, um, we're able to zone in on a, you know, the, um, a barber family and, and see what that leads in terms of future research. Yeah, this, this became a law and order case. Uh... 100 years later with, with using DNA to, to match somebody. But I got to wonder, when you said the name Barber, I got to wonder if uh, anyone contacted Paul Barber, the guy who wrote Vampires, Burials, oh, and Death. Oh, right. that's right. I don't know if there's any... <laughs> I don't know if there's any relationship, but uh, yes, that's right. You know, um, if he does some ancestry, then uh, it would be interesting certainly to find out. I always wondered why in that part of the world vampirism got blamed for diseases spreading instead of witches or just a curse or something else why why do you think people 
focused on vampires? Well, I think it's because it was coming over from Europe. I mean, these were Europeans, uh, you know, the uh, the Browns and the, and the Barbers, and the, they were all European settlers in that area. And, um, you know, by the time of the American Revolution, you start getting Europeans coming over to help uh, us, the French, but also Germans who were helping the British, the Hessians. Um, and some of them stayed in the area, some were doctors, and they were bringing over here traditions of especially Eastern Europe, where there are profound beliefs in, in vampirism. The whole Bram Stoker story uh, takes place in Eastern Europe. And, we, and, we, and, and those, those, those beliefs in vampires and the undead are still to this day very strong in Eastern Europe. So um, what I think is going on is, uh, um, you know, that connection coming over from Europe with the idea of, of vampirism spreading diseases. Now, the farmers here were desperate. I mean, the families that were affected by this were, were you know, their loved ones were dying. Their, their, their sons and daughters were dying uh, and they couldn't stop it. And uh, so they were desperate when, when again, when the doctors and, and, and churches couldn't help them, maybe, just maybe this idea of the dead transmitting the diseases was worth looking into. Um, you know, we've been dealing with a, a, a COVID virus and the contagion there. Um, you know, and, and I've said to, to, to people, you know, if, if, if the vaccine, um, if, if our modern, our tremendous modern medical uh, um, technology you know, even doing simple things like wearing a mask and avoiding crowds and, um, and, and, and the vaccine. If none of that were successful and we were still dying and our families were still dying, people would do, how do you want to say, irrational behaviors um, out of fear and out of love to protect the, our, ourselves. Um, you know, fortunately, we have a wonderful technology, medical technology today, and the vaccines are working wonderfully, and, and, the, uh, and the masks have helped. And so those things have been very helpful, but consider if they were not, what might we do? I'm not saying we're going to go back into graves, but, but this is what they were confronted with back in the 19th century. They had no way to stop the deaths. So maybe, just maybe, this was the way, and they were certainly willing to to experiment. In fact, Michael Bell has, has um, uncovered a number of uh, documents where, town documents, where people have, you know, gone to the town. They want to conduct an experiment by digging up their daughter. And the experiment is to see if she's undead to protect family members. So, um, you know, there is a modern parallel, uh, but back then, no antibiotics, no real good medical uh, technology to help them. So they were willing to try this if, um, um, if it would work. We know it's a false hypothesis, but they didn't back then. They were willing to try. You jumped ahead of me just a little bit because I was going to ask what would it take for something like this to happen again? Yeah. And, no, and, I, mean, and no. I think we, we're staring at the parallel right here in history. That's right. We're experiencing you know, an epidemic and... Um, um, you know, we're handling it in a different way because of the fact that we have, you know, the technology that helps us and to, uh, better understand it, the science behind it all. They, they didn't have that back then. And, uh, to that end, what was it that ended the American vampire scare? But two things really happened uh, that really at the turn of the last century, uh, just after the Mercy Brown case, really, uh, a few things are starting to happen. Number one, Dr. Robert Conch um, in the late 19th century was now starting to find the mycobacteria of tuberculosis consumption. Um, and now what was happening is we started to have a medical answer for the disease. Um, so there, along New England here, uh, there were um, tuberculosis sanitariums that came up along our waterfront. Um, that to, to, to hospitalize people that had uh, consumption or tuberculosis. Um, you know, it was thought that the fresh, the salt air was, 
was helpful to the lungs. So we see the, the we see a scientific explanation developing at that point. And then I think the other thing is, um, you know, Bram Stoker, uh, British playwright, publishes a book called Dracula in 1897, and it becomes an overnight success in New England and the Americas as well as in Europe. Um, but there, he now equates the story of the undead um, as evil, as the macabre, um, as horror. So social attitudes now change. The perception now changes going into the 20th century that you don't do this kind of stuff anymore. But back in the eight, you know, in the early 1800s or in the 1820s and so when some of this was going on, um, you know, this was not horror. They, they weren't happy about going back in the graves. But the fact is, if it meant saving the loved ones that were still alive, it was worth doing. Um, there was no social taboo. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we've got a case up in, in Vermont where 300 people show up to watch to see if a woman that's being dug up is in fact a vampire. So you're talking socially acceptable, but after Bram Stoker, this is not socially acceptable anymore. And if anything, uh, if it continues into the 20th century, it continues underground, uh, literally and... <laughs> well played. <laughs> clandestine let's put it that way. Well, like you said uh michael bell has identified more uh well he i think he uses the word troublesome corpses that continued on past that whether it was the same idea whether the people digging up right. the corpses had the same uh concept of what was going on i don't know i i have Yet he hasn't published the new book yet, so I guess I'll have to wait and find out. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to wait to, to see what he, what his thesis is. But um, but you know, there's there's social things going on, but there's also scientific explanations that were unavailable uh, back in the early 19th century, uh, and even uh, you know the Brown family in the 1890s. But once I think you know once Dracula comes out, it, it changes everything. They didn't use the word vampire, yep. the, the people at the time, or did they? They did. Uh, um, you don't see a lot of it in the literature, but when you look at that tombstone that Michael Bell uh, showed me, where the tombstone dates to the 1840s, it's got vampires, consumption, consumptive. Uh, I, th vampires, I think it's although consumption's grasp. vampire grasp. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're, they're using the term in conjunction. I, I had always heard that, that that they didn't use the word vampire, although the practices matched up really well with what happened in Eastern Europe. But uh, what I'm hearing from you is that, no, that the word did get uttered and it was thrown around here and there. Right. It wasn't used as, uh, how do you want to say, here as uh, often or, uh, you know, until Dracula comes out. Uh, but um, But the term was around. If we run with the needle in the haystack analogy for just a second, is it possible that JB is an outlier because his body was treated so much differently than a lot of the other accounts we know of? Yeah, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, we assumed that, you know, the fact that when we did, did the forensic work um, that he had uh, tuberculosis was a real key thing that he was in Eastern Connecticut, which was a hot spot for this activity, uh, that he was a rural farmer, uh, that the, the burial dated to really uh, the, the early 20th century, uh, excuse me, the early 19th century and a real hot time for this vampire folk belief to be circulating. Um, you know, I'm just not sure how much of an outlier he is because he's in the right place at the right time with the right disease um, for what we know of the, th of the vampire folk belief. But um, again, it could just simply be, there was no heart at this time and a decision had to be made and they were desperate. Were there any other parts of the world where you can find these exact same practices going on um, as a response to the same epidemics? 
Yeah, well, uh, you know, vampirism, you find it all over the world in cultures, even going back to the ancient Egypt, Egyptians. Um, um, and many of the times it's, it's associated with death and disease. Um, you know, the prey to spread disease and so forth. I, you know, our, um, our modern fantasy of uh, vampirism gets stretched out in, in, in fiction. And, uh, um, but basically, yeah, there's been a lot. And decapitation um, uh, of, the vamp of the supposed vampire, um, we see that played out in many parts of the, of the world, um, in Europe. There was a there was a, a a woman that was thought to be a vampire uh, in a cemetery in Venice, and they had uh, put a, a brick in her mouth to prevent her from feeding and from chewing on shrouds and feeding others. So um, these are quite common. Uh, again, JB it becomes really unique in the, in the degree of um, uh, dismemberment. Uh, disarticulation of his bones, but but decapitation is very common. Can I ask you a few questions that were submitted? Sure. People people want to know uh, when they heard that uh, I was going to be interviewing you. People started pouring in questions. Uh, Luca Alcroft from Amino wants to know whether rearranging the bodies was meant to kill a vampire, or whether the ritual was just uh, somehow to stop them from coming up out of the grave. Yeah, I think it was basically to stop the dead from leaving their housing of their grave um, that they were capable of doing. We have no uh, information as to what form that took place. Um, you know, uh, Bram Stoker with the wolf and then uh, other, what did it take? Was it an animal? Was it the human himself? Was it just a spirit that came out and fed? We really have no information on that uh, as to what form the vampire takes. But um, I, I'm, the idea is to put them to rest, make them dead, dead, and prevent them from leaving the housing of their grave. There's a sidetrack here. Uh, I'm working on reading Varney the Vampire from the uh, mid 1800s right now. And there's a chapter right in the middle of volume one where they're going to dig up a grave that they suspect of vampirism. and the grave diggers have this debate amongst themselves, like, well, well how is he supposed to get out? How is he supposed to come with all that, all that soil? And so someone gets slapped for suggesting that because they're making things too complicated. And you're thinking about this too hard. <laughs> He's getting out of the grave somehow. That's right. Uh, how the form is, is uh, um, you know, uh, was beyond them, but it, beyond all of us. But it's, uh, um, right. But something had to be done to prevent it from happening, no matter what shape it took. Um, Luca also wanted to know, was it believed that the vampiric condition was contagious? And, and she added on, was it hereditary? Could you inherit this uh, ability to spread disease? No, uh, tuberculosis, you mean? It's, it's well, totally... whatever the people at the time thought was the condition, they might not have, I don't know what term they would have used for it, if they would have said consumption, if they would have just said the, this, this thing that's killing people. Did they think that could be passed down from generations or was it something that could only be uh, spread through the spirit coming? Back? Yeah, you know, I really I really don't, I'm sure it has, I, it, you know, the, the diff, different terms would have been used uh, uh, for the undead um, and it, it certainly would have been passed on uh, and the stories were passed on. We know from the, from the um, Mercy Brown case that you know, the stories had come down through the family uh, right into the modern age. And, uh, but they didn't share it until Michael Bell started coming forward as a folklorist. It was something that was kept quiet within the families, um, especially into the 20th century. But sure, um, terms and what happened would have been family lore, if you will. It would have been part of the family's histories, whether they spoke publicly of it or not is a whole different dimension. Uh, chances are, especially as time went on and more medical uh, scientific explanations came on, they probably stopped telling the story after a few generations. But terms, the stories would have all been shared uh, um, with family members. Folklore, 
how you know those tales and stories get told and they get changed a bit and uh, but uh, many of them have a basis in truth. I hope I'm saying his last name right. Tim Presil or Presil on Twitter wants to know when you're digging into such graves, what is your greatest worry? Well, first of all, you know, you, you, one of the greatest worries you think about is certainly uh, uh, health, you know, wor working in these graves. Uh, in, this case, in these cases, when you're dealing with old burials that are nothing but skeletons, the, the, the coffins are wood and they're decomposed and rotted, there really is very little, if any, health concerns. Uh, the real dangers for archaeologists are opening up crypts um, that might still have bacteria or soft tissue. In so in terms of metal coffins, someone buried in a metal coffin before embalming, before all of that is changing everything, um, there is a, a, you know, uh, there might be a concern. Um, we worked on, a, we had a burial case come up in Danbury, Connecticut, where uh, they were putting in electrical lines into the ground. And so with a backhoe, they were digging a trench uh, to a new construction. Uh, and the backhoe operator, his claw got stuck. And when he jacked it up, um, metal came flying and steam came flushing out. Um, and what he had encountered was a cast iron coffin that dated to 1870. The individual in the coffin was um, um, still um, fresh enough, if you will, to um, have soft tissue, clothing, every, everything was so well preserved, even though it was desiccated and dried out. So those kind of cases can be very tricky if people had died of, say, tuberculosis, that could become almost airborne in, um, in the immediate area. So going into metal uh, coffins, um, you need to make sure you're protected, even so much as gas masks and you know surgical gloves and so forth. But uh, but these kind of burials are not, are, are, are not are nothing. They did not use embalming fluids back then. The first embalming fluid in New England. Um, and in the Americas is actually um, arsenic and used during the American Civil War in the 1860s to get soldiers home from the battlefields um, uh, in a condition that uh, uh, would allow them to be you know, recognized and buried uh, by their families. Um, so late 19th century burials sometimes have arsenic as an issue uh, in terms of public health. So, Yes, there are precautions we definitely take um, um, when we deal with these kinds of cases, but, but uh, usually when you go back far enough um, and you're talking about dry bones and decaying wood, it, there's very little health issues involved, but we do protect ourselves as much as possible. You're not at all worried about that curse that you unleashed. Oh, no, by <laughs> No curses. Listen, I would have, I'd have been gone a long time ago if there were curses. <laughs> well, this, see, this, this was 1990. The burials. <laughs> this was 1990. Maybe you're responsible for grunge rock in the 90s. I don't know, but uh, we, uh, um, you know, the way I look at these things and the work we do um, is that, you know, again, the only time we deal with burials are when they are being affected by construction or vandalism. And then we see once all the science is done and the, we see that the remains are appropriately reburied according to their cultural prescriptions, whether they're, if they're Native American, you know, we work with the, the Connecticut Indian tribes and, and see that, that they are appropriately reburied by um, spiritualists. Um, um, in this case, uh, um, at, at the cemetery in Griswold, we found out that uh, the, the the family, the original Walton family, this was the family that used the cemetery before the B family, potentially the barbers, um, were members of the first congregational church. So we had a reburial of everyone based on, um, you know, with the Sarah, Puritan ceremony, recommittal ceremonies of Puritan tradition from the congregational church. So I like to think that we treat uh, all the remains uh, in a, a respectful way. And uh, so um, that really is quite beautiful. We won't have any problems. <laughs>
Um, Nicole Eisner wants to ask, uh, is there a telltale sign when you first open a grave that what you might have is a vampire grave or does it take a lot of investigation before you can make that determination? Well, we've only had this one uh, in terms of, uh, um, um, of a vampire case. So we only have this one burial to go by, JB's burial. Um, and again, when I first saw it, I was unfamiliar with this vampire folk belief, and I was I was just befuddled by what I looked at, uh, all this dis you know, rearrangement of the bones and uh, decapitation and so forth. Uh, I had no context in which to put it into. So certainly if another burial came out um, uh, that had similar clues, if you will, uh, that we might be able to focus back in on it. But, you know, it's with archaeology, it's, you know, recording, documenting, making sure you have everything in place and then trying to find out and test the remains and, and so forth. For example, one of the things we might want to look for is evidence of charcoal and burning uh, of some sort within the graves if they were burning hearts. Um, there are a number of different, what we do in archaeology, is we develop what's called test implications. So if, if, if this was a, a new burial, if this was going to be a, 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 another vampire case, what should we expect to see? What are the test implications? So one of them might be, you know, charcoal. Uh, one of them might be rearrangement. One might be broken rib bones going in for the heart and so forth. So what we do is we, we develop those uh, test implications and then, and then test them to see if they hold up to what we know best. Now, in terms of JB, could he have been dug up for another reason other than this concept of the undead? Sure. I, even though my students think I go back that far, I wasn't here in the 1820s. Uh, uh, so could that have been another reason? Absolutely. But all we could do as archaeologists is go by what we find, how we analyze it, test hypotheses for possible explanations, and see if, in fact, they fit. And right now, there is no better explanation that fits for what we found with JB um, other than the New England vampire folk belief. What could change that? Is there, can you imagine a piece of evidence that could come to light that would completely change how you view JB? Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, you know, um, I remember, you know, like I said, I thought fan maybe somebody broke in to, to, to vandalize uh, some, you know, funerary object, uh, but uh, Again, that didn't hold up in terms of our, uh, the test implications because there was nothing in any other burials to steal. Why would we suspect that there would be something in this particular burial? Um, so I don't know. I don't know what we have the data, we have the bones, you know, we have, we have the, the information that could be used to retest another hypothesis, but uh, the, no better one has come to light to date. What's, what's a piece of evidence you would love to have to help you? really sealed the case on JB? Oh, I, I, I think the, the, the one thing that we found that knocked me off, off my chair was the, was the evidence of tuberculosis. That was so key. I mean, because in every case we have of, of the vampire folk belief in New England, it's associated with consumption and tuberculosis. The key would have been if JB did not have or show us signs. Now, sometimes tuberculosis does not always show up on the bones. Um, you know, if you, you contract tuberculosis and you die relatively soon, while it invades your, your lungs and, and soft tissues, it may not embed into the bone. But if you have it in a chronic condition, then it has time to invade bone tissue uh, and as a result show up. So. You know, if uh, we did this uh, uh, analysis and there were no signs of tuberculosis, there would have been a huge question mark about whether this fit the vampire folk belief or not. But he, he had it and he had it chronically uh, enough so that his family went and dug him up to protect loved ones. Uh, so um, the thing that might throw this off a bit would be if we found the dates of his son um, uh, ne, ne, if it's in fact the barbers, but NB and his wife IB, we would make an assumption. Now there may be other family members too. We just don't know if. Remember, these are usually large families, but these are the only two. Um, you know, his wife and his son that we have. Uh, 
But it might be interesting if we were ever able to find the death records of all three of them. I think the hypothesis would be that he dies first. And they subsequently come down with the illness and they're, they dig him up to, to try to uh, prevent the wife and the son to die or dying or one of them or another family member. The thing is, we never found tuberculosis uh, on uh, either the wife or the, um, the son. The, the wife's bones were very friable. Uh, they were practically disintegrated uh, and the ribs especially were gone. So we really had no, uh, nothing recoverable to determine that. Uh, and the son uh, showed no signs. His bones were better preserved, but he showed no signs of tuberculosis. So um, those are, those, you know, there are some things that could come up uh, if, we, if we knew the, 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 the times, timing of the deaths that might be uh, useful to uh, suggesting another hypothesis. But right now, we, after 30 years, we haven't found a better explanation. Um, Asexual Pride, who's also on Amino, asked, uh, in a forensic examination, is there a specific finding that all those accused of vampirism have in common? Now, you've talked a lot about consumption yeah, as yeah. being the common thread. Are there, is there anything else that we might look at and say, well, all these people were the head of the household. All these people were the, the first to die. All these people, what have you. No, with not without the records, uh, you know, without the historical records, that becomes really difficult. But no, it's it's the key here is you know unless you know Michael Bell and his research were to uh, <clears throat> excuse me um, find another um, biological symptom uh, that might be helpful. Uh, but you know, TB consumption is 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 the big one, and um, certainly that was a powerful indicator that JB had been rearranged. Um, because he was suspected to be undead and feeding on his family. Excellent. Well, that's all of the uh, online questions. Um, you told a story, though, I heard in a lecture that I'd, I'd love to hear you tell again about a gentleman in England who believed in uh, vampires so much that he surrounded himself in garlic. What happened to that guy? Yeah, well, basically, there was, there was a case, evidently, we were doing research on all of this, we were compiling uh, materials from all over the world. And um, we found a, 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 a newspaper account that talked about in England, it was about, you know, maybe now I'm going to say maybe 15, 20 years ago, where uh, um, 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 a gentleman was deathly believe, believed in vampires, believed in vampirism, that it was real and was definitely afraid that they were gonna get him at night when he slept. So he would put three cloves of garlic in his mouth um, before he went to sleep, um, hoping to ward off the vampires while he, uh, he was in slumber. And uh, uh, unfortunately, one night a clove dislodged and got into his esophagus and he suffocated to death. They found him dead the next morning. And I like to say, did, you know, did the, do vampires exist? They got him. They got him because his belief produced a cause of, of, of behavior, produced a behavior that led to his death. In anthropology, we, there's an old saying that says, whatever is conceived of as reality is indeed reality because we can see the consequences in human behavior. So if you believe in something, you'll act a certain way. And that makes it real to an anthropologist because it's human behavior that has a source of reality. So this guy believed in it and, and they got him. And so it's, uh, it's the same with back then. What we're looking at with JB is we're looking at the end result of a behavior. People going back into the ground, digging into him, rearranging him, closing him back up. And the question we have is why? Why did they do such a thing? The evidence is there. Um, and then it's, it's matching it up with the historic record and, and all the other test implications we could have. But it's their belief system that led them to that course of action. So there's a reality to it uh, beyond actual vampires. Well, you have had quite a career. I was reading a little bit of your bio. And uh, this episode was a really small part of... Nick Bell and Tony's very long <laughs> career. 
but I gotta ask, how much has has this kind of come back, and um, how much have you had to live with JB being a defining moment in your career? Well, uh, it's it's a major one. Uh, we've had a, an amazing career. I, I'm very lucky individual. I've been blessed with uh, many of the projects I've been involved with, but. Uh, the, re the reason it stays, we're still talking about it 30 years ago, later, is just the sensationalism of it. But what I liked about it is that it, it, it's a really neat way to help teach about science, about archaeology, about forensics in a very unique way. Um, it teaches us history and about human behavior in the 19th century and so forth. But you know what? It, it's a great way to teach science and uh, it, it keeps the students' interests. Uh, and so um, to me, it's, it's, it's not only has had longevity uh, over the years because of the sensational aspects of it more than anything, but, um, but it's also a great way to teach science. And that, that's what I like about it. In the last year and a half, it's taken on maybe yeah. a, a bigger impact given that we're living through a pandemic that has some parallels with the epidemics people were living with back then. So yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, and there, and there may be lessons to be learned here about, you know, how they dealt with it in the early 19th century and how we dealt deal with it in the early 21st century. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope, you know, uh, this comparison with the, the current COVID pandemic um, that people today have a, a, an appreciation of what those families were going through in losing loved ones uh, and, and, and you know, resorting to this. They didn't want to go in and, and, and dig up JB. They didn't want to uh, do any of this, but they needed to protect themselves when there was no other answer. So, you know, hopefully, if, you know, we, we get a new sense of appreciation of the fear and the love of the, those families had and what they were going through. That, caused them to do this. Well, Dr. Nick Bellantoni, I can't thank you enough for being here and telling this story that I know you've told before, but hearing it again fresh one-on-one -on -one was a highlight of all these webcasts. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. This has been a, been a lot of fun at our end. Thanks again to Dr. Nick Bellantoni. I've wanted to have him on this show for a while now. He tells quite a tale. Uh, he has two books out uh, that I want to draw your attention to. The Long Journey's Home is one of them. It is about uh, several bodies that were disinterred in Connecticut and how he prepared and shepherded those bodies back to their native lands where they came from, uh, the Dakotas and Hawaii in both cases. Uh, fascinating journey how those bodies ended up in Connecticut and how he made sure they got back safely to where they belonged. His other book was uh, And So the Tomb Remained about going into five different mausoleums in New England and what he found there. As I said at the start of the show, there's also an interesting episode in Dr. Bellantoni's career where he examined the skull that was purported to be Hitler's. He doesn't have a book about that, but I'm going to see if I can find a couple resources that I can link to in the description down below. I hope you can come back for another Toothpickings. There should be one out before too terribly long. But until then, I hope we can take a lesson from the endemic diseases that people had to deal with in the 1800s and apply them to our current pandemic. And let's not do anything too irrational in response to the moment we currently find ourselves in. I'll see you in another moment soon.